Well, um, I guess I will do a little bit of introduction. Um, so I'm an associate professor of geology. I've been here since 2001. I moved here from uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in, in Maryland. And it was a long-standing desire to get back to the West. I was very happy to, to do that and to land in Portland. And um, my family and I are very happy here. I have two twin boys. And uh, just when I was growing up, my father was a professor as well. And so I have this kind of romantic notion of the university environment and the smell of chalk dust, as it turns out. I'm horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I insist on teaching in classrooms with chalkboards. And I finally figured it out. It's because it's like happy times in my... Um, so it always full circle. Um, there was some sort of shifting around in where I was going to do this presentation and what materials I was going to have um, to get to listen to me. Um, but I did bring, we have um, a new department brochure for the Department of Geology that we just made. We had a big um, meeting in town this fall, the um, Geological Society of America had a meeting here, we made a new brochure for our booth. It was the first time we ever had a booth at GSA, it was very exciting. So I brought those, and we can just, I guess, pass them down, if you want one, take one. Um, so just a little bit about sort of the, the range of things that we do in the department. Um, what I do is polar glaciology. Um, I got my start thinking about ice when I was an undergraduate. Um, working on the Juneau ice fields in southeast Alaska for my field camp, and I then went on to uh, Ohio State University where I did a master's degree working in the field in West Antarctica, um, doing sort of working in remote kind of tent camp locations, making measurements on the ice sheet, and it turns out that a lot of the questions that you might want to be asked if you're sort of an expansive thinker you can't answer with just a simple set of measurements made over a couple of years in, in the Antarctic. And I realized that um, what I really wanted to be doing was what we call numerical model. So writing computer programs that simulate the physics of Earth systems. And so I went on from Ohio State to the University of Chicago um, to work with sort of one of the pioneers in doing that kind of work in, in ice sheets and sea ice and um, things like that. And then I went from there to NASA Goddard, which if you're a consumer of data, which is what you could think of a model as being, they're a great producer of data. So it was a good place for me to be for a while. But I really missed the university kind of environment and all the random stuff that happens here that doesn't happen if you're in a, a very engineering research kind of environment. And so it was a happy thing to return. And it's certainly the case that while most of my work is still Antarctic, um, or at least polar glaciology and theme, since I've been here, because of the interests of students that I meet in our department, I am, sort of, my horizons are changing a bit, and they're becoming, in some ways, more local. I have a couple of, as you read, uh, projects going on here in Oregon that certainly would, they, they grow from my expertise in numerical modeling, but there's certainly problems, groundwater problems, that I would not have thought about or I not here and interacting with students who want to pursue these sorts of questions. And um, in that vein, a couple of years ago, the USGS uh, Water Res Oregon Water Resource Center moved on to campus. And that was very important in terms of finding projects for students who wanted to do modeling, but with some more, perhaps more immediately practical uh, application than, you know, polar glaciology. But as it turns out, people now care about polar glaciology too. Um, if you're a connoisseur of reports about climate change, you probably know that um, there's a lot of change going on right now in Greenland. And um, outlet glaciers in southern Greenland, these um, glaciers that flow through kind of gaps in the mountains that ring the continent, that drain this big mass of ice in the interior, since right around the turn of the century have been speeding up. And they've been discharging more mass into the ocean than they used to. So you can think of an ice sheet as just, it's a big part of Earth's hydrologic cycle. They're big reservoirs of fresh water. They store most of Earth's fresh water, about 75%, something like that, is locked up in ice in Greenland and ice in Antarctica. And so when the flow of that ice, or that sort of balance between the new snow coming in and stuff that's lost back to the ocean, when that changes, it can drive big shifts in the planet's whole hydrologic cycle. And the thing we think of, there are lots of climate connections, but the thing we think about immediately is sea level rise. And so if you 
if you have this big reservoir of water and you suddenly start returning it to the ocean, sea level will respond, it'll go up. And um, depending on where you are along a coastline, the impacts can be different. We think about things like um, coastal erosion, changes in storm surge, changes in um, sort of coastal flooding when there are big storm events. And these are all things that we see changing right now um, as a result of global warming. And as sea level continues to go up, which it's going to continue to do, those impacts get worse. So um, just in the last five or six years, the sort of work that I do that had sort of prior to, to changing Greenland been thought of as kind of you know, an interesting you know, very theoretical world has suddenly become a very applied world. We really want to know what's driving the change we see in Greenland and, and in America as well. And um, we want to be able to make some kind of projections of what the future is going to be like in these systems, or at least projections with some kind of range of uncertainty associated with it. So the work that I do um, is, is more on the trying to understand the physics of the system side rather than making that projection, but it all fits together into one big endeavor. And um, there's a, a group, if, if again, if you listen to the climate news, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, is a, a group of scientists and politicians that on a sort of a seven year, five to seven year cycle issues a report that talks about what's the state of climate right now, how are things changing right now, what are the best projections of, of the future. Um, and for many years, since the first of those reports, polar glaciology or polar ice sheets was not a big issue. The, uh, the emphasis was the atmosphere is getting warmer, that means it can hold more moisture, that means precipitation overall increases, more snow falls on ice sheets, good news for sea level. Right? If you're storing more ice in the ice sheets, that's going to be a sort of a small net loss to the ocean, which compensates a little bit for other things that are causing sea level to rise. Um, and it was sort of thought that the, the, the flow part, sort of just the, the fact that ice is a viscous fluid, it accumulates in the interior of the ice sheets and then flows out to the coast and either melts there or calves off as icebergs which float away and melt that flow part was sort of thought to be too slow to care about in a human context. The ice sheets are big, they're thick, they're cold, they're sluggish. Why worry? And I'm dramatizing, but more or less, <laughs> that's what was written in these reports for a number of years. And those of us in the kind of more theoretical, ice, what we call ice dynamics um, part of the discipline would say, yeah, you may well be right, but there's really no theoretical basis to say that. Um, and probably want to invest some effort in evaluating that issue. And our, our comments were duly noted in the report came out saying, yeah, don't worry about the ice in this car. And then things started to change in Greenland. And these outlet glaciers were speeding up by orders of magnitude in some cases. And people said, oh, you computational glaciologists, why didn't you tell us about this? <laughs> and that's more or less what the most recent report said. <clears throat> but, oh, there's big change happening, and the modelers haven't told us anything useful about it. <laughs> like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> we tried. But so the, the, the good thing that comes out of this is that now there is a lot of attention being paid, and we are attracting outstanding students who are interested in starting to do this kind of work. And, you know, I, I often say that, um, that, that around the planet, if you look at the people who do the kind of work I do, you could fit us all into a clown car. And um, we're going to have to have a trailer for all the students, which is really good. You know, things are changing. And, um, and, and, and there, there's sort of more money. Now, this is the reality of this, is that the way I get to do this work is by writing proposals to federal funding agencies to get support for the students to work with to, to carry this on. Um, and that's starting to happen, too. Um, the big national labs, like Los Alamos and um, some of the others are starting to get interested in this as a computational program. So these big national labs that for years have been interested in <coughs> computational programs or um, problems mostly for doing simulations of bombs. Now they want to do simulations of climate, and they're increasingly interested in this ice sheet component 
as well. So that's a nice thing. We have access to different resources than we did before. New opportunities for students to gain those very specialized, um, highly technical kinds of skills. And it's really very rapidly changing um, what's, what's happening in the field. And um, I'm really pretty much at the heart of that change in the U.S. We're having a big change in the way we think about writing the programs, writing the, the models, working together as a group. Um, for a long time, just because the funding was small as a community, we were all, there was one of us at this institution, one of us at that institution, we did our own thing, we wrote proposals to answer very specific questions, and sort of the development of these just computational tools was not a priority, it was answering questions that was a priority. And, um, so we were a very disorganized group, just by the nature of the way things traditionally got done. And now that there's this very strong sort of societal push to do better, we're learning to work together. Um, we're looking at what goes on in computational climatology, so what the <coughs> atmosphere and ocean modelers do, how they build these big suites of models, how they work together. We've had there was a series of workshops in which we sit down at tables like this and try to figure out how to talk to each other, harder than you might think, because we think on different time scales, different space scales, um, different kinds of prioritizations for what you absolutely have to get right. You know, and we can say, you absolutely have to resolve this particular thing. If you can't get that right, there's no point in doing it. And they just laugh at you and say, we're never going to do that. And so it's been good. To, we're learning how to communicate. Um, amongst ourselves and then with other disciplines. And um, there, there have been a, a series of workshops that, that we as a community have held to figure out how to do that. And we hosted um, one particular version of that here at Portland State uh, this summer. We had what we called a short course on ice sheet modeling. And um, we had 38 participants in total, half of whom were what you traditionally think of as students, so graduate students or postdoctoral researchers, and half of whom were um, that are professionals working in the discipline at, at a range of ranks. And our idea in putting it together was that, in one way or another, everybody in the room was a student, and everybody had something to learn from everybody else. And so we had a set of lessons and exercises, but there was something that was new to everybody, and so we broke participants into groups of sort of five or six. You know, somebody who's good at programming, somebody who's good at the atmosphere part, somebody who's good at something else. And then everybody worked through the course together. And it was really a different way to frame it than had been done before. And it really would have been, not been possible without the great um, technology support that we got here at PSU. And my colleagues from around the planet, um, it was a very international thing. Um, we're just amazed at our ability not only to put it all together here, with the, the good support we had, but to be able to do things on the fly. So as the course evolved, our needs changed, we need to fine tune things, and we always had the support we needed. And you know, to a person, everybody else said, this would not have happened at my institution. And I don't know why that is about this place, but I think it's that kind of scrappy underdog, let's make this work kind of thing. And. Um, that, that was just, it, it just, it worked because of that. And we were able to do something that was truly different than what had happened before because of just the way this place works. And um, it made me feel good that, <coughs> you know, that I didn't have to ask very hard to get the support I needed. I just had to lay it out. This is what I'm trying to do. This is why it matters. And people said, sure, we'll make this happen. And it did. Um, so that's kind of a big overview of all these different things I, I work on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, some specifics. So I have this, well, in our department, we have this beautiful raised relief globe, which is great for this, but I couldn't find it this morning. I was prepared to roll it down the street and get it here, but I couldn't find it. So we don't have it. Happily, you all were born with a map of Antarctica right here. This is great. It's all weather. Um, Really though, are, is, are most people familiar with sort of what the continent of Antarctica looks like? Yeah, right. So <laughs> here's the Antarctic Peninsula. South America is off that way. Um, East Antarctica is indeed a big pillow of ice. It's quite thick. Um, 
the West Antarctic over here, there's a mountain chain called the Transantarctic Mountains that run right along through here, come up towards the peninsula, and then you jump across Drake Passage, you get to the continuation of these mountains on the other side. Um, when we look at where change is happening right now in the Antarctic, it's mostly along the Antarctic Peninsula, and sort of coming around around that uh, heel, whatever that's called, over here into a place that we call the Amundsen Sea. Um, there are a couple of big outlet glaciers that drain the West Antarctic Ice Sheet there. And these are all places where, um, well, everywhere we see big change in ice sheets right now. It's where there's an interface with the ocean. And um, the, the leading ideas for why these changes are happening primarily have to do with ocean warming. So as the planet, as the atmosphere warms up, that heat is transferred to the ocean as well, the shallow ocean, and then through the circulation of the ocean that gets into the deeper ocean, the ocean as a whole is warming up. And as it's warming up, the water that comes in contact with the ice at that marine boundary is changing. So there's increased melting, you can have increased iceberg calving rates, and all those things then that are happening at the edges of the ice sheet or what we call a forcing. There's a sort of pushing on these systems, and the systems are responding. And um, I'll try to draw. I'll try to draw a picture. So this is my my standard ice sheet. Um, let's see. I'll draw a bed underneath. It's going to be a funny one. This is the land of the side. There's my ice sheet. You can ask my students. That's really what it always looks like. Okay. More or less. Can everybody see that? All right. Mm -hmm. is that <coughs> All right, so we got snow falling down in the interior of the ice sheet. That snow piles up, it densifies into what we call glacier ice um, over a number of years, and just due to its own weight, because it's got a surface slope, gravity compels it to try to flatten out. And it does that as a, as a viscous fluid, like syrup that you pour on a table. It flows out towards the edge, where if it's warm enough, so if we imagine, well, We'll make this the ocean side. There's, oh, I ran out of room. There's the ocean over there. If it's warm enough up at the top, it just starts melting, and we have runoff either into the ocean or onto the land surface. If it's cold all the way, which is the case in most of Antarctica, you get out here to the front and you just calve off icebergs. It's just a fancy word for they break off. Um, so fractures propagate from the top and from the bottom, and they <coughs> pop off and sail away. Um, in a global warming kind of world, there's, there's really two ways you can affect the ice sheet. One, you can change how much melting is going on on the surface. Just by, if you, if you imagine that, we call it the equilibrium line. Um, if there's some boundary in the atmosphere where, say, below that line it tends to be warmer than freezing, and above that line it tends to be cooler than freezing. Down here is where, or up here is where you get sort of net accumulation. The snow hangs around from year to year. Down here is where you have net melting. Right, so we're gaining mass up here, we're losing mass down here. If you warm up the atmosphere and that boundary moves, you then get a consequent change in how much melting you're doing year to year. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do is um, lop off, have some kind of big calving event that happens as a result of surface, more, surface melting and remove a bunch of that floating ice. The system then has to adjust to that change. Or you can, and that might be related to the ocean too, or you can change the temperature of the water that's coming up here underneath. So if we imagine that this is the, that's the land surface, this is the ocean, here's the ice sheet. The ocean water circulates underneath that floating part and then goes back out. We call this floating part an ice shelf. Okay. Um, so if you put more warm water down there, you can cause that boundary to move, you can change the thickness of the ice again, you can generate some sort of perturbation that's going to propagate back up into the ice sheet. And we see all of those things happening right now. This one is pretty easy to deal with. It's just what's the temperature of the atmosphere, how much melting you can get over the course of the year. It doesn't affect the flow very much. It's easy to deal with. These are more complicated to deal with. Um, and this is the part of the problem that I mostly work on. How well do we understand the physics of these processes sort of at, at fairly detailed levels? How important is the shape of the bed underneath the ice sheet? Um, 
what is it exactly that drives that fracturing process and how what drives it to change over time? Those are the kinds of problems that my students and I are working on addressing. And as I said, to do that, we use a combination of these computational tools, um, programs that we write that solve partial differential equations, <coughs> and observations that we make from space using satellites. Um, we don't do too much field work, although um, a few years ago I did have the opportunity to do a couple of seasons in West Antarctica. Again, there was 14 years between my first trips in the early 90s to the Antarctic and this most recent ones. And, uh, it wasn't obvious to me that it was going to be the same experience I had when I was younger, but it turned out it was even better. <laughs> Other than missing my kids, I was even more excited about shoveling snow than <laughs> It was good. Um, in, we have other, in our department, we have other Antarctic work going on as well. Um, and there's, in the little booklet, there's a description of uh, what Andrew Fallon does as well. So I think my time is up. Just there, like, two more minutes if anybody has any questions. Or... Mm -hmm. I should have said that. Yeah. Jump in at any time. <laughs> One other question. You talked about um, people communicating from sort of the different disciplines. It strikes me that you've got these different models and uh, they have to take input from each other on, on per certain parameters and so forth. So it is really critical to have people communicating so that they can really flange up and you don't get sort of unintended consequences. So. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a big part of the whole endeavor. And for a long time, it has been the case that ice sheets were sort of used as a sponge to solve other problems or models. Black box. Like so, well not exactly a black box, but more like you're giving and taking friend. So, you know, so if you have it in the Southern Ocean, if you have a problem with exactly getting the right amount of fresh water into the shallow ocean, or having the salinity right in the shallow ocean, you just say, oh, well clearly there's more icebergs coming from Antarctica. And then you write that into your program and you solve the problem. So now that we're saying, oh, you gotta do this part right too, just as you say, it causes all these other ripple problems that maybe these guys didn't understand their physics as well as they should have either, and so you have to. The, yeah, there's lots of work like that. How many students do you have that are involved in actually doing study in the This kind of stuff. So in my program, um, right now I have I have uh, three active <coughs> graduate students working with me, which is about as much as I can handle mm -hmm. at any given time. Um, and actually one of those is doing a groundwater problem in the Deschutes Basin, which is, is, it's an important topic, it's what he wanted to do, I think it's interesting, so I said sure, we'll, we'll figure it out, we'll, we'll, the money will appear and we'll make it happen, and uh, through collaboration with folks at the USGS, we really have, it's, it's a nice project, I don't have time to talk about it now, but. It's a critical <laughs> project for Oregon. Yeah, it yeah. really is, all those. <laughs> How about uh, doing any study on uh, glaciers in Oregon? Right? Andrew Fountain uh, in our department does, yeah. This um, sort of the sad story of watching the glaciers waste away. Except for the one in the crater on Mount St. Helens. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah, actually there's some interesting work going on um, so all around the West. And they've been collaborating with the Mazamas, the mountain climbing group, to do aerial photography of these glaciers to document change over time. Mm -hmm. well, I'd be happy to give out your contact information if I can, if anybody has further questions that come up later. So. Thank you. Thank so you very much. much.